it's sometimes more prudent to upload after the conference <laughs> than before. <laughs> Sorry. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Um, it is great to see so many of you here today. Uh, and it's a pleasant su surprise to see that, uh, despite Brexit, uh, European affairs still generate so much interest in the UK. Michel Barnier, bonjour. Um, it's a pleasure to have you at the Cambridge Union for the first time. French is improving. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, I heard that you've spent the last day in Oxford, so we'll make sure that uh, your time in our other place is worth it. Um, the way this is going to work this afternoon is, so we'll start with some questions uh, about the Brexit, ne Brexit negotiations, the future of the EU, the influence of the EU in the, wor in the world, and then we'll open the floor for questions. Um, given that Mr. Barnier is on a tight schedule to catch his Eurostar, we'll try to accommodate as many questions from the audience as possible during this one-hour interview. So Michel Barnier is a French politician who has served in many notable French cabinet positions, notably for foreign affairs and uh, for the environment. More recently, he served as chief negotiator under Article 50 from 2016 to 2019, and then as the European Commission's head of task force for international relations within the United Kingdom from 2019 to 2021. He remains a prominent figure in European politics, and this will allow a fascinating, fascinating insight into the world of Brexit negotiations. He just published My Secret Brexit Diary, which is available online, for instance, on Amazon. So Michel Barnier, um, from the outset of the, British, the, the Brexit negotiations, the two sides of the channel, so UK and EU, were very confrontational with uh, some European countries wanting to make the UK pay for its decision, while the Brexit hardliners were numerous in the UK. So my first question is, why did you accept this uh, Mission Impossible? And what do you think your own personal contributions to the negotiations were? So, uh, first of all, uh, good, good afternoon to all of you, and thank you very much for your time and your, your attention. Thank you, for, Paul, for your invitation. Thank you, James, for your invitation. And um, I'm very honored and privileged to spend one hour with you after spending one hour and one hour and a half uh, yesterday in really in another place. Huh? <laughs> uh, uh, you, you forget, Paul, just one point which is important in my biography and my long personal political history that I, I, I used to be the, the president of the region of France, Savoy, in the Alps. Uh, and uh, at that time, I spent 10 years, 81 to 92, to organize the Winter Olympics. 10 years for 16 days, and it was a good training for the Brexit. So, uh, in fact, uh, a few days after the, the Brexit referendum, June uh, 16, uh, the, the, the president of the commission, uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, I was at the time a part-time, one day per, per week, uh, his special advisor for defense. The very first time the president of the commission was involved in defense matters. Um, asked me in Varsau, I remember it was a meeting between NATO, uh, the president of the US, Obama was there, and we had a meeting with him, a private meeting, and, uh, and the EU. The Jean-Claude Juncker asked me if I could agree to be the, the, the chief negotiator of the commission. And obviously, it was a totally extraordinary task, because it was clearly an extraordinary and historical and unique negotiation of the you can't say no. Well, what could be, what could have been my, my added value at that time? Uh, I was close from Jean-Claude Juncker, and to be clear, the expertise for the negotiation was and is clearly in the Commission. The Commission is kind of um, executive body of the, of, the, of the EU, and all the policies, all the policies of the EU with the member state, with the parliament, are uh, managed in the commission. So the expertise is there. Uh, in particular, when it's about uh, 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 Brexit, that means the, the, uh, uh, the unraveling uh, uh, 45 years of, uh, of, nego of, of cooperation between the member states. So, uh, um, I, 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 before, 
his request. I, I spent 10 years in the commission as a commissioner, the French commissioner, a European commissioner from France, uh, two times. The first time as a commissioner for regional policy, the structural funds, the main budget in the EU, and uh, the second time as a commissioner for the single market and financial services, just in the middle of the financial crisis. So I, I know I knew quite well the commission. I've been a member of the European Council as a French Minister for Foreign Affairs and uh, also a member of the Parliament. So I knew the three institutions. And it was clear that to succeed, to succeed on the EU side, uh, this, this negotiation, it was absolutely necessary to, to put the three institutions together and to, to build the unity of the 27. So I think it's the reason why Jean-Claude Jurke saw that I had an added value. Um, and the, the literal translation of the French title of your latest uh, book about Brexit um, is um, The Great Illusion or The Great, the great uh, Misconception. What misconceptions do you think the British had about Brexit? And what do you think our misconceptions as Europeans were about Brexit um, and maybe about the British? In fact, I, I, I chose this, this title, the, the Great Illusion, uh, for, for two or three reasons. Uh, the, the main one is that uh, I think uh, leaving the EU, leaving the single market, leaving the custom union, which is the choice of the UK, to leave everything. What, we, what they call the hard Brexit. It was not an obligation. No? Let me record that. It was perf perfectly possible to leave the EU and remain in the single market. One of you is Norwegian. No? So, uh, Norway is, uh, is not in the, in the EU. And Norway is a part of the single market with the right and the obligations. But it was perfectly possible even to stay, which could have been, in my view, the minimum for the national economic interest of the UK to remain in the, in the, in the, in the custom union. In the, the custom union. But the, they decided to leave everything. So, so it was not obligation. So, so. In your book, uh, My Secret Brexit then, Diary. Just, just to, to, to complete my, my answer. Uh, I, I, I just the title means that for me, uh, leaving every, everything to, to, to be alone, which is the case with the UK today, uh, in the global world, uh, thinking that you can be stronger being alone is an illusion. When you have the size of France, Germany, UK, Italy, uh, uh, don't, don't speak about the others, but uh, even for the, 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 the biggest one, the Germany, it, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a force, it's a strength to be together. And for my country, obviously, so I think it's an illusion to, to think that you can defend your interest, uh, promote your ideas, your, your ideals, uh, your values, uh, more efficiently alone than together vis-à-vis -vis the China, Russia, or, or the States. Huh? So, so, um, well, the first illusion. But the, the second illusion is on our side to think or to have thought that uh, the Brexit will not happen. And uh, uh, the, the Brexit, the uh, gentlemen, was improbable, even for the Brexiters, even for those who ran this campaign, Farage and Johnson. A few days before, they, they were not, not sure to, to succeed. To, 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 and it happened. Um, so the second illusion is for an old side to, to be careful, because something improbable could happen in France or in other countries. So we have the first chapter of my book, which is a very good book, uh, <laughs> in English, in, Sp in Spanish, in, in, in Romanian, in Greek, okay, uh, in French. Um, the, 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 the first chapter is called uh, Warning. A warning, because I try to understand why 52% of the British people vote against Brussels, against you, and vote to, to, for the country to be alone. And, and, they, and we, we don't, we, we have to be careful about not doing a mistake. Yeah? Uh, obviously, there is the, the, the populism, obviously, there is a, the lies, obviously, there is nationalism of Farage and some others, the support of some people in the city. 
But the, 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 the real reason of Brexit uh, is the, the, the social anger in many regions of the UK, huh? where there is no future, no, more, no longer industry or no more uh, agricultural policy. So we, we need to, to, to be careful and to, to understand the social anger, to listen to it, and to, and to answer. It is why the, the first chapter is called uh, a warning. Huh? It's too late for the UK, it's not too late for us. Um, talking about your book, uh, you mentioned the fact that um, some UK officials during the negotiations tried to um, circumvent you to um, directly talk to uh, national leaders uh, within Europe. Um, so can you tell us a bit more about the dynamics of these negotiations? Yes, uh, every day uh, they try to divide us. Every day they, they try to buy spy, to buy pass to to go directly to the President of the Commission to try to divide us going in each and every country and to... But uh, I, 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 I got very early the trust of the 30, the 27 leaders of the EU, the, the head of states and the and prime minister. I can explain why and how. Uh, I, I got the trust of the parliament. I, I have always had a very huge trust and, uh, and confidence in the Commission, that they lose their time. Their time. For, for one reason, at the end of this long, long negotiation, in any case, we needed to be unanimous, to agree on such a treaty of trade agreement or Brexit. It was an obligation for the 27 member states to be unanimous. That means that each and every national concern about the Brexit must have become the, the concern of the 26 others. I can take some example. Ireland, which is a more sensitive question. Peace and stability in Ireland. The, the, the peace in Ireland, the stability of Ireland, became very soon, thanks to the Taoiseach in Ireland, the Prime Minister of Ireland, but also my work, became very soon the concern of the 26 others. And they were solidaire. Uh, Fishery, eight member states are concerned by the fishery in the British water. All the others support these eight member states. Uh, Spain with Gibraltar, Cyprus, Cyprus. Uh, you have in Cyprus two military sovereign bases of the UK in the middle of the Cyprus. It posed a very specific concern and this concern became the concern of the 26 or so. That means that the obligation to be, the obligation of unanimity became a tool for unity. But the real reason of the unity of the 27 is, is another reason. It's the fact that uh, I asked the President of the Commission at the very beginning of the negotiation in 2016 and 2017 to use a very unusual method in Brussels, which is transparency. Transparency, not usual, I can tell you. That means that we decided, with support of Jean-Claude Juncker, to say everything, to tell everything, on every issue of the negotiation, every day, to everybody at the same time. So we, we put in place a group of 27 Brexit delegates, very interesting job, and my deputy or myself, the same in the parliament, uh, went to meet these Brexit delegates of the parliament every week, at least two times per week, saying everything. That means that each and every prime minister or president in each country receive every day a compte rendu of the negotiation. So it, is, um, it was the, the, the main tool for the trust. They trust me because I, I exactly made what I, I said to say everything to everybody. Uh, the second point is that I, the president of Juncker and the president of the European Council, Mr. Tusk, which is Polish, asked me, which was totally unusual, to take part to the European Council when the point of Brexit was on, on the agenda. So I, I, I was seated with the, members, the, the president and prime minister of the EU for each meeting where they spoke about Brexit during four years. And this created a real personal link of trust between them and me. And finally, I decided to go every week, once per week in one member states, meeting the prime minister in his office, the key minister of finance, foreign affairs, 
the parliament, the national parliament for hearing, public hearing, the press, the trade unions, and the business community. One, one capital per week during four years. And all this work explained why from the day one to the last day, the 27 member states and the parliament was uh, united. I hope that was clear for you. Not, not given by chance. Huh? That's perfect. And uh, the last, last point is that I, I had the privilege to share an uh, incredible team of 70 people, 70 people, um, 18 nationalities, uh, very young, half men and women. It was an incredible team for the Brexit on our side. Great. Um, moving I on. I don't want to comment the British. <laughs> <laughs> the third point I did to mention, it was a weakness for the British to change their negotiator every year. I've, I have in face of me four negotiators in four years. One per year. That's enormous. Um, um, you ran for the, the French Republican Party primaries uh, during the last presidential campaign. Yes, another topic. Yeah. Yes, moving on to the other topic. Um, it seemed that many candidates, um, not just from the right and not just uh, in France, um, have strengthened their views and have become more, more radical. Do you think that a moderate candidacy is still possible to be elected in the current state of European politics? Uh, what, what, what means moderate? Uh, I, I don't encourage you to, be, to, 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 uh, to have moderate opinions. You have to be proud and strong on your, on your opinion. And I always try to be so uh, since my very first involvement in politics, but I was 15 or 16 uh, in my lycée in, in Savoy. So, so uh, but I think, yes, that it's possible to have strong and, and, and proud opinions uh, on every subject, uh, and at the same time to express this opinion with respect for the others. So, well, is that a work for me? Did it work for me? Because I tried to take part in the French primary in my party, and I was not elected. Uh, it was not a failure for me, huh, if I may quote uh, Mandela. Huh? Uh, uh, I, I, did not love, I did not lose. Uh, I did not win. Because I, I, I get a lesson no? at that time. Huh? Absolutely. Do you think Hungary should be allowed to take presidency of the Council of the EU, despite its rather flexible interpretation of the rule of law? There is debate uh, for, for the current days in, in Brussels about this. It seems difficult to. to to block the, the Hungary to, to, to chair the council. But uh, I think this debate is useful to, to show to Viktor Orban, I know quite well Mr. Viktor Orban and the, and the, the Hungarian government that they, they have to be careful. Huh? But I think it, um, the, 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 the process of the EU has always been a process of inclusivity. And so, so I think we have to, to continue this process and to try to convince some of them who are just on the borderline to be careful. Um, moving on to the last topic of our discussion before opening the floor to questions. Um, there have been many criticisms following the, the failed uh, French submarine deal and the AUKUS alliance. The um, French, French what? Um, le, L'accord sur les, les sous-marins en, en Australie. Ah, sure. um, <laughs> President Macron has recently warned that Europe should not be a follower of the US and that it must build its own strategic autonomy. Do you think there is room for such autonomy at a time where Europe is divided and where its aggregate defense budget hardly rivals those of China and the US? This question is not about the Brexit. No, but, no. But, uh, no it's OK. I am ready to speak about everything. <laughs> I to try to give my opinion. But number one, on the AUKUS uh, crisis, I think that uh, what the US and the UK did against France was not something to do be, between allies. Huh? It was not correct. And uh, to be clear, uh, this kind of attitude could have, uh, could have, uh, have consequences, because we have mm -hmm. some difficulties to forget the fact that our allies, mm -hmm. UK and, and, uh, and uh, 
And you yes, well, well, of course. And you, you see what happened in Australia. So, so, um, number two, what the president from France said is correct. We are, without any kind of ambiguity, the islands with the US and the others, and the UK and many others. Uh, but an islands doesn't need allegiance. Huh? Islands doesn't need allegiance. So uh, we need to keep our own capacity to decide for our own interests. And it could be useful to have this kind of uh, autonomy, uh, looking at what are our, our interests and EU, EU members, not in particular in the, in, in the Pacific. Uh, yes, I think that uh, uh, we have to draw the lesson of the recent crisis we face, not only the war in Ukraine, but also uh, the COVID crisis, but also the Brexit, but also the migration crisis, but also the financial crisis 15 years ago. And uh, what, I, what I observe from each of the crises of the EU, frankly speaking, has a good answer, shows a real resilience and draw the right lessons. And all these lessons are going in the same direction. We need to build again our autonomy. It's not uh, contrary with uh, alliance, uh, solidarity, but we need to, to defend our autonomy and our own capacity. And for instance, for speaking about the, the, the war in Ukraine, in, in three points, uh, Autonomy and solidarity about defense, autonomy for the food security, autonomy for energy. So it is, these are the lessons we have to draw. The reason why uh, we need, uh, my, if I can express a political opinion, which is very strong for me, we need in each of our country, and many of you are coming from, I think, European countries, we need to be patriot and European at the same time. In the global world where we are, in the global world where we went, where we are going for, to, we need to be uh, uh, European in addition to be patriot, uh, specific in addition, not at the place of. Uh, and from an economic and innovation perspective, Europe still lags behind, um, lags behind China and the US on the world stage. Do you think that the EU Chip Act stimulus is the right way to correct this? Or do you think that um, the stimulus will come from the European industry and the startup ecosystem? So, in other words, uh, should the EU produce more and more uh, legislative acts to attempt to protect the Euro European economy? Uh, uh, producing a, a legislative act is not producing. Huh? Uh, so, so, the first priority is to produce and for EU to be a territory of production. Or for agriculture or for industry or for the new technologies. So to, to, to remain or to be again a territory of production. And to be frank, I, I know at least two countries, this one, except perhaps in the new technology we spoke about, with some of you about what happened in, in around London, but frankly speaking, for the last 30 years, the UK has abandoned a part of its industry to the benefit of the services. The same in France. It is not the case in Germany. It is not the case in Italy. It is not the case in Sweden. So uh, we need each and every European country and Europe as a whole to uh, remain or to become again a territory of production. But a part of the answer to the question of autonomy. Uh, and as far as the regulation are concerned, or the act, the Digital Act, I think we have to be uh, less naive. The, the, the US are producing a legislative act to protect, and to even to go to a kind of protectionism uh, to defend the industry, and I think we need to, not to be naive. And I think that in the last 20 years, the European Union has been, has, has been too naive in the in its trade, in its trade relation with the others. For instance, the, the key word for our relation needs to be reciprocity. It's a very real problem to accept to import goods for industry, for good from, from, from the agriculture, uh, 
which do not respect the norms that we impose ourselves to our own farmers or our own industry. We need reciprocity, which each and every uh, partner do. Um, to continue on this question, um, what position it do you think? It was not the last. Huh? Sorry? It was not the last. <laughs> <laughs> um, what position should the EU take in the rising conflict between China and the US? And do you think a third way is possible? Yes, I think so. Clearly, uh, as far as democracy and freedom is concerned, are concerned, we are on the same side with the US, huh? no, no, no ambiguity. We are allies and, and we, 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 we respect these islands. Uh, but we have, our own, we have our own interest and we, are saying we, we, we need to keep it, uh, our autonomy for, to defend our interest in, the, in this region of the world. Huh? So we need to keep a, we need to keep a link and a dialogue and a relation with China without asking the permission to the US. If it is your question. Exactly. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we're now going to turn to audience questions. Um, ah, so please raise fine, your hand please. if you've got a question. I think if this was the, the me, first. Just tell me who you are, from where you are coming. Please. <laughs> My name is David Grace. I'm retired. A young, a young student. I, have, yes, I was a student a long time ago, and I have worked in Brussels also. Not for the European Commission, but uh, lobbying it on behalf of other people. Um, I'm sure you're aware at the moment, um, Monsieur Barnier, that most British politicians are unwilling to talk about developing relations with the European Union. Indeed, some of them are scared to talk about it until we have a general election. But after we've had an election, sometime in a few years, if we have a government that can see the sensible case for rejoining the single market and the customs union, what would the reaction of the European Union be to that? Yes. <laughs> the door is open. Without any kind of ambiguity, the door will remain open. Everybody in the EU side regretted I've regretted the, the Brexit, but we have respected the vote of 12, 52% of the British citizens. No, no question about that. We have delivered the Brexit in a fair way. I think I, I've been always very respectful toward the Brexit, uh, the, the Brexit, uh, the, the, the British government and my counterpart, always because I have great admiration for this country. And we have delivered the Brexit. Res Respecting the, the, the interests of the EU and uh, protecting every day, every day, the integrity of the single market. But uh, everybody has regarded the Brexit, so the door is open, frankly speaking, for, for any kind of menu. As I said during all of the negotiation, the, break, the, the UK was not obliged to leave everything. Of if they want to, to come back to the custom union which could be, in my view, personal, I express my personal view, the minimum for the national British interest, it's, it's, it's open. If they want to join, to rejoin the single market, but the paradox is that the, 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 the UK joined the EU in 73. I remember this time because I was 21, and I vote for the first time in my life to the referendum organized by the French president for the accession of UK, Ireland, Norway, and Denmark. And I, I was a member of the Gaullist party, but I campaigned for the yes to the accession. I never regret this vote, because I think we are stronger together. So uh, if they want to join, to rejoin the digital market, OK, and see what they would do. I don't know if it will be probable in the next few, few months or years, but the, the, the door is open. The only point I want to mention, when you join, we rejoin, we want to access to a certain organization, that the EU institution, which is totally unique in the world. Huh? You can find nowhere in the world and never in the past uh, a, a totality of a continent organizing himself uh, as a community of nations, respecting each and every nation, the national identity of each and one, pulling the policy as we are building for 60 years in Europe. 
uh, there is rules, there is norms, there is conditions. There are, there are norms, there are conditions. There are, the UK knows quite well the conditions. That means that joining or rejoining means respecting the, the, the condition. In France, we say um, the cahier des charges. Huh? Uh, uh, so they, they, they will have, in any case, to, re, to respect. That means that from now to this time, I don't know when, I don't know, I don't know when, uh, what happened as far as divergence is concerned? What will be the size of the divergence for the social regulations, environmental regulations, uh, fiscal regulations between EU and UK? And this point is very important. If the size is too, 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 too strong and too, too far, too, too long, too, it could be a problem for, for rejoining. If, if, they, they, if they keep, uh, which would be clever, the, 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 Main part of the, the common, co common corpus, common corpus we add together for the moment because they have the same corpus of regulations. If they keep the, the main part, it could be easier. You, you, you see what I mean, huh? This was a clear answer. And Rakunia? Yeah. Yes. Does that work? Yeah. Okay. Um, Raku Martins, um, I'm a research fellow in social psychology. And um, so I was wondering, from my analysis, so um, after yeah, the Brexit referendum happened, in the beginning it looked like people were looking at the soft Brexit first. And then over time it became more and more extreme on, on, uh, on the British side mainly. But I wonder, and it accumulated of course in, in the election of Boris Johnson with a hard Brexit agenda and so on. I wonder if part in that um, go, going to more extremes is also something in the tone of the EU negotiators with UK. So as a, I, as a social psychologist, I, so I, I analyze a couple of documentaries just, just by myself on, on Brexit negotiators and so on. And for example, I'm also a Belgian, so I, I really liked it when Peter Hofstadt was Prime Minister of Belgium. Um, but when I looked at documentaries where he was talking about Brexit and so on, I, I couldn't help noticing some tone of arrogance or lack of intellectual humility. And I wonder if that kind of put fuel on the fire and led to, to some uh, British people um, looking at you in a more negative way, more arrogant bunch of people who think they're better. Um, so that's not my personal opinion, of course, right? But I just wonder if you have any, any thoughts on that. Yes, it is also a good question. Uh, I encourage you to read my book. Huh? Uh, to <laughs> To, to, to see the part of psychology, which is important in negotiation. Huh? And to, to be clear, before the very beginning of the negotiation, I spent a lot of months to study clearly what were the techniques of negotiation everywhere in the world, in particular in the UK, in the history of the UK. Huh? So I spent a lot of time. But my line was very clear from the very beginning of the negotiation, in terms of attitude, to be always calm, which is, which is not so difficult for me because I am a mountainer, uh, respectful, to have no emotion, no passion, to respect everybody, uh, and uh, uh, to be never, never nervous, huh? and never putting in place a kind of rhetoric. And the paradox of the surprise for me, to be frank, was all along the negotiation, and in particular the last year with uh, Johnson and uh, uh, his minister or his negotiator, David Frost, that it was clear that the rhetoric and the ideology was on the UK side and not on my side. Despite uh, the fact I am French, uh, I, was, I was less arrogant and less ideological than uh, uh, the other side. Huh? So, Surprisingly. <laughs> and it was clear, it was important. Any other question? Yes. Politics. Um, but I wanted to ask you about, you brought up earlier this kind of illusion of the, like the British on both sides and you know, the question of why did the English and British think that they were better on wrong. Um, and that kind of brings me to um, Global Britain, the policy framework that was published last year 
um, that kind of staked out a new foreign policy framework um, for the UK post Brexit. And you can very clearly see that there's a lot of focus on the Indo Pacific. And that's on what? On the Indo Pacific. Um, and on the Commonwealth. Um, and this kind of, which has a lot of imperialist undertones, if we're being honest. Um, and there's very much a focus on this. And so I want to hear your opinion on whether you think there's a viability um, to kind of the Commonwealth replacing um, a lot of relations that the UK has had uh, in terms of the EU, or do you just think that this is another illusion? Well, I know the story. And I respect the story. UK, which has been a, a very great country in the world, an empire, uh, which is still a very dynamic diplomacy, a defense. Uh, but you can, you can face the, the future with nostalgia. Huh? The same for France. For France, sometimes we have so many people in France which, which practice nostalgia. Huh? So it's not a good, a, good, a good thing to do when you are in politics. No nostalgia. Souvenir, mémoire, proud. To be proud, but no nostalgia. So uh, to be frank, uh, what you say is impossible. India, for instance, which is a very, very big country, huh? and a very large democracy, uh, but all the other members of the Commonwealth knows what is the reality. And this morning I was in the, and Bloomberg TV, and uh, I will ask about the, 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 the visit of Rishi Sunak today in, in Washington, and what could happen about a, a free a trade agreement between US and UK. And I, my answer was, I, I wish the best to the UK, but the US knows the reality. And what is the reality? We are now two different markets, UK and EU. There are different markets country and Norway and, and you, we are the same market. But that, we, we are two different markets and, and it's clear if you look at the size of the markets, everybody knows the size. 60 million consumers on one side, 400 and, 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 and four, 50 million consumers on the other side. This is the reality of the trade. Huh? And for India and for all the, all the members of Australia, New Zealand and the other members of the Commonwealth. So, so this is the reality. Please. Thank you. I'm sorry, but I, I will have to leave at 30 because I, I have to catch up right now. Uh, next question. Yeah. Do it. Thank you. My name is Toby Oswald. I'm a history undergraduate here. My question is very simple and follows on somewhat from the first question. Let us imagine in 10 years the UK was trying to rejoin and the negotiating side from Britain wanted all of the carve outs, all of the opt outs, all of the original negotiated exemptions from the treaties. Do you think the European side would be willing to welcome that, particularly if it was the point of tension which might allow a British government to re-enter Europe as long as they got those opt-outs back? Or is there just no chance? No, I, I, I know the opt-outs. I know the fact that the UK did not want to join the single currency. OK. Uh, Schengen, OK. But as far as the single market, which is the core, the main asset of the EU is not yet our defense policy or no foreign policy, not yet. The, the main asset of the EU is a single market, because single market is not simply a free trade zone. Single market is a, a, totally, a total ecosystem with same norms, same, uh, same standards for the consumers, for the industry, for agriculture, the same regulation, the same supervision, the same jurisdiction. And I don't think there is so many, there, there were so many opt out for the UK in the single market. No, to be clear, there, there will, if there is a, this, ask, this request to, to rejoin, there will be no, no opt out for the single market. Huh? Thank you. Any other questions? Please, please, in the middle. So, yes, uh, you are very patient. I'm a first year history student from just up the road here in Johns. Okay. Uh, my, my question is um, obviously, we all watched as Theresa May struggled desperately to try and pass the original deal. And the result of that failure was the rise of Boris Johnson. The European Union in that time took the position that very little about the treaty can be reopened, that this was in effect the EU's final offer. The position that seemed to change in October 2019. 
Do you think the European Union could be more flexible and extended a more open hand to Theresa May? And do you think the failure to do that was at least in part responsible for the rise of Boris Johnson in the UK? No, but, but when, you are, when you are in my position as an EU negotiator, you negotiate with the, 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 the government of the, of the, 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 the UK. Right. I, I didn't choose the government. And during the first three years, the government of the UK was the government of Theresa May, which, which was and which is, uh, who is, who was and who is, uh, in my view, a uh, courageous uh, state woman. And we tried to find a solution for the most sensitive issue, which, which, which was and which is still the Irish issue. Because in Ireland, ladies and gentlemen, it's not a question of trade, or of goods, or, or techniques. It's a question of peace. Uh, it's a question about people and a peace for the people. So we try to, to find a solution to square the cycle in Ireland. Because what creates problems in Ireland is nothing else than the Brexit. Nothing else. The fact that the part of the island, island of Ireland, leave the EU, leave the same market, and that the fact that the consequences it was and is that we need control and checks. A cow, a cow will leave in England by boat, entering in Ireland or Ireland in Belfast. This cow, if there is no border on the ground in Ireland, this cow is entering in Germany, mechanically, or in France, the same day that it reach uh, Belfast. So we need to control for safety reasons, for, to protect the consumers, to protect the, the business, to protect the budget of, of, each, of each country. So the, the, we need checks and control. I never spoke about the border. Just I try to de-dramatize this fact, but the, 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 I try to find solutions. We find a solution with Theresa May at the end, after several proposals on my side, and finally the proposal agreed by Theresa May was to include the totality of the, the, the UK in our uh, uh, border um, uh, um, custom union. It was the, the last solution of, of agreed by Theresa May. And finally, she tried three times to get the agreement of the, the House of Commons, and she, she failed because of Mr. Johnson. Johnson tried and said, I don't want this. And I said to Johnson, OK, uh, but we need to find a solution because we need control. We, we agreed to have no border in Ireland. OK, it's a condition of peace. But we need to have control and checks for what entering the goods, vegetables, animals entering in, in Northern Ireland. And finally, we, we, we agree with Johnson at the end of 19 on this extraordinary option, unique option to have the territory of Northern Ireland, both in the single market of the EU and the national market of the UK. It is what, what, what is at stake. And I regret profoundly that a few weeks after, Johnson decided not to recognize what he had signed with us. I think it's not fair. It's not correct for the for a prime minister of such a great country as the UK not to recognize and to respect his own signature. And finally, we, we lost two years because of Johnson. And finally, Rishi Sunak agreed with us to a specific agreement, the Windsor Agreement, to implement uh, the protocol and negotiate. So this is, this is the real story. And once again, you can read my book. And, uh, and you recommend it. Please, please, please. Yes. Whether the support that was shown to 
important during the initial Brexit negotiations would have continued as, as strongly as it had, and where that might have ended up had it not been the case that Rishi Sunak came in and the Windsor framework had been agreed to diffuse most of the tension around that situation. Yes, I don't, I don't want to reopen all the books of this story, uh, but the fact that finally we reached an agreement with Johnson. I can tell you that he negotiated word by word, comma by comma, sentence by sentence. No surprise. Uh, Frost and the team of the UK, which, is, which was a very professional team, they negotiate every word of this uh, protocol on Ireland, include, included in the first Brexit treaty about the divorce. Uh, and the second treaty I negotiated was about the future relation and trade agreement. In this first agreement, they negotiate every word. Of, they'll say, no, exactly what could happen. That's the reason why I didn't accept at that time and do not understand today why and how the Prime Minister of the UK can be able to say, I don't want to recognize my own signature. So this, and this treaty was managed by the framework of the Court of Justice, as you know. Huh? So uh, when he decided not to unilaterally to say, I don't want to put in place to implement what I signed, uh, we, we put in place uh, the procedure in front of the Court of Justice. The reason why we spend, we lose two or three years until Mr. Sunak arrived. Sunak is uh, uh, less baroque than Mr. Johnson huh? and more serious. And finally, we reach an agreement. And I'm very happy that now I hope that the British government and the European side will implement. Uh, linked to the Windsor Agreement Protocol on Ireland. Because once again, in Ireland, it's a question of people and peace. Yes, please. Uh, please. So, uh, Philip, my name is Philip Debord, representing in Germany. I was wondering how do you envision the future of the European Union? Do you want to have it more federally structured or more centralized? Uh, be careful not to use words which had not the same translation in the different countries. You know what means federalism in your country. But if you ask the French what means federalism, it's exactly the contrary. So federalism in your, in, your, in your country, in Germany, means trust and confidence to the lander, the, the regions. Federalism in the global mind of the French people means centralization. And uh, the idea that everything could be decided in Brussels is not a good idea. So, so we have to be careful. Now, I, I, I never, never accept or I, I was always careful not to, to, to put us in the prison, the, the, the European project in the world. We are, we are uh, in a very unique and extraordinary, unprecedented construction. Never in the past, nowhere in the world. We have such a construction that the, the, the dimension of the continent of 27 member nations pulling their destiny. So we have to respect this complexity uh, uh, and to explain this complexity to the people, huh? which is a key point for the democracy and for the future election, to explain why the, the, the management of the EU is complex. Because we try to pull 27 nations respecting the national identity of each, of each of them. It cannot be simple. If it is simple, it, it will be uniform. We want a united Europe, not a uniform Europe. So uh, my, 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 my hope, my, my dream, is uh, respecting national identity, um, uh, is that uh, Europe will have the, the will, the wish, the, the, the courage, the political courage, the leaders to to build the power, to build the power. What what means the global power? Economy, currency, defense policy, external policy. We are not yet there, but we we are on the path, in my view. And when I look at the, the way we react to the different crises since 15 years, financial crisis, Brexit, migration, COVID, Ukraine, and the base of everything, the climate change. I think we are on the path to, to draw the lessons and to be, to be stronger and to, to become this global power, which is in the interest of each member state, each member state in the global world. Do we have time for one more question? 
depends on the time. It's 24. 20, 20? 24. Okay. Yeah. I have to leave at 30. Great. Please. This is a more EU internal looking question. I'm from Carlos Slovenia. I'm a PhD student here. Um, over the years of negotiating this, you have to sort of balance the varying views of EU countries and the countries were pulling in different directions. I'm wondering how you view of the European Union and its sort of strengths and weaknesses as a unified power has changed, if at all. Sorry, could you repeat your question? No, because Sorry. <laughs> How your view of the European Union has changed through the negotiations, basically? Uh, you can judge, you cannot judge or uh, look at the EU only uh, through the, the, what happened for the Brexit. Uh, because the Brexit is a, a negative negotiation. The Brexit is a divorce. Uh, I, I have no personal experience in divorce, huh? but many of my friends have had an experience, unfortunately. And all, all my friends told me that the divorce is always painful and costly. You know? And that's the case of the, the Brexit. Huh? So we, can, we cannot look all what happened in the EU and what could happen in the EU in the future through only the Brexit uh, 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 principle negotiation. But the fact is that we have been united in a very, very difficult task and issue. Once again, this unity was not given by chance. Huh? I, I work every day to the unity because it was key to succeed. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, more cleverly and more positively, if you look at all the crises we face, uh, once again, we, we face this crisis in, since 15 years with a, a, a huge degree of resilience. And I think the reaction of the EU, as far as our autonomy is concerned for energy or for food, uh, to, to rebuild industrial policy, uh, it will, to, let me tell you that uh, I was commissioner 10 years ago, it was impossible in Brussels to speak about the industrial policy. It was impossible 10 years ago to speak about the common Common organization, the border, the extent border with uh, 10,000 people, uh, uh, 10,000 posts to to, for, to, to, to 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 keep the borders. It was impossible 10 years ago to to speak, speak about reciprocity in our uh, trade agreement. 10 years ago, we were at the top of the incredible. Uh, period of deregulation for financial services. And the reason why, when the crisis uh, happened in 2008, we were nicked, we were, we were totally disarmed. So, so the, the, we, we had the, the, the good reactions. I'm not optimistic, but I think we have the reason of, of trust on the European project uh, today, right? it's my feeling. Maybe one more question, or should we call it today? No, I think, uh, no, my, my assistant told okay. me that uh, we have to leave because I, my, 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 my train is in 20 minutes. So I, Great. I was told there, we need 10 minutes to go to the, the station, so I'm very sorry. But I, I, in this place, with the right place to, to, to be, I'm ready to come back. Okay. Thanks Thank, you, very much. Thank you very much.